Hello, this is Ann Zeiss with DZ Open Lens Productions. Today we have as our guest Dr. Sunil Dwan, uh, who is a graduate of San Francisco State University and the University of Southern California School of Medicine. Um, he is um, currently the dermatologist at the Center for Dermatology in Fremont and Milpitas, and also uh, a, a teacher at the uh, at Stanford University's School of Medicine Department of Dermatology. Welcome, Dr. Dwight. Thank you, Ms. Ice. It was nice to be here and give people some information on the sun and skin cancer and skin care. I think we've, we can get started. Uh, this uh, talk has been here for many years and we've modified it, so let's get going, if you don't mind. The sun, beauty, or the beast? The skin has uh, several functions. It has protection. It has temperature regulation, sensation, and secretion. These are the layers. There's the epidermis, the dermis, and the subcutis. Three layers that offer protection uh, and other functions for the skin and keep everything inside. We have skin cells that migrate to the, toward the skin surface. They form a protective barrier. It takes about 28 days to go from the bottom to the top. Certain diseases like psoriasis and other things make this cycle much faster and that's why you get a lot of scaling and flaking with those conditions. The pigment cell is very important in the skin. As you can see, the person on the left has less pigment, uh, probably from Northern Europe. Evolution, with evolution, we've evolved to uh, having uh, less pigment when we need to absorb more sunlight in darker areas, such as Northern Europe. In more in Africa, you need more protection, so you have more skin uh, pigment cells and more pigment within those cells. Uh, so those, those uh, people who evolved and had very light skin in very sunny areas would get skin cancers and basically there would not have descendants and would die off. That's the evolutionary theory. The hair follicle is also very important. It's associated with sweat glands and oil glands and the hair shaft. This is a component, an important component of uh, the skin. The sun, it's the uh, giver of life and the taker of life. It's very important for everything we have. Some facts about sunlight is that the risk of sunburn is greatest between 10 a.m. and 5 p.m., or 3 p.m., I'm sorry. Up to, up to approximately 80% or 90% of sunlight can penetrate cloudy or overcast days. Some light fabrics and wet clothes do, can transmit a large amount of sunlight to the skin. So when you're wet, uh, you can get a little bit more uh, sun coming in. Hats and speech umbrellas do not provide full protection. Sunlight is reflected by sand, water, porch decks, and snow, especially snow. So if you notice, a lot of ski instructors who also teach tennis in the summer up in Lake Tahoe have pretty sun-damaged skin even in their 30s, so very, they have to be more careful. There are several types of ultraviolet rays. UVA rays, which are thought not to have been important 20 years ago, are actually very important and can penetrate glass and plastic. So the glass that's in your car does not offer much protection against these rays, though it does block the UVB rays, and we'll talk about those in a second. These are the three kinds of rays. There's UVA, UVB, and UVC. UVC is blocked by ozone and never reaches the earth, apparently. Uh, UVB penetrates into the first and second layer called the epidermis and dermis. But UVA, which is the culprit for a lot of things now, does go down almost to the deeper layer of the second layer and almost to the third layer and does do quite a bit of damage. Many sunblocks used to be only UVB protectants. Now they're all UVA and UVB to be more effective. Um, this talks a little bit, this slide talks a little bit more about those rays. Uh, UVA rays penetrate deeply, are equal all day, all year, whether it's cloudy or sunny all latitudes, all over, whether it's Denver or here or any height. UVB is a little bit more restrictive. Uh, it's blocked by uh, things like uh, auto glass and uh, it gets less during the end of the day. It's, more, it's less in a higher climate, I mean, less in areas that are um, more northern and with less sunlight. So it is a little bit more forgiving, but still contributes to problems. Uh, what are the uh, differences between UVA and UVB um, rays here? Uh, again, uh, the UVB rays are more skin burning, UVA rays are more uh, penetrating, but they both combine to be 
very um, difficult and cause problems as we age. Let me just go through this and make sure I haven't missed anything. Um, yes, all day intensity for UVA, all intense year round, maintain intensity in all geographic regions and penetrate through everything and UVB is a little bit more opposite. Well, the type of damage is basically sunburn, sun aging, and skin cancer. Those are the three big things. Now, most people don't think when they're 15 or 20 that the sunburn that they got then can lead to melanoma and issues later, but it's very important. The studies have been very conclusively done that the numbers of sunburns that you get, blistering sunburns or even bad sunburns, between the age of 12 and 18 or 12 and 20 correlate very highly with the risk of melanoma and long-term sun exposure uh, with not as intense burning but just tanning and getting red but not burning uh, correlates with your risk of the other two types of skin cancers that are important. So we need to uh, protect when we're younger, especially our young children, and especially between 12 and 18 when we're a little bit more foolish and, and do things that we're not supposed to do because we're adventurous, but also as we age. Um, so we need to, to, to do all that protection. Um, so again, UVB is there and UVA kind of complements it and hits it pretty hard. Some of the variables of sun exposure, skin type, very important, and we'll go through that. So here's a guy, he's actually a, a guy I trained with. I lined all these guys up when I was in training and got a very good uh, estimate of, of what uh, the variables of skin exposure are for skin type. He's light-skinned, light-eyed, Northern European, light-haired, blonde or red hair, and burns every time he goes out. And this was in Miami, and I'm sure he would burn very easily. So there we go, a close-up view of him. This is somebody probably more from mid or middle Europe, uh, you know, uh, Hungary, uh, maybe a little bit more southern Europe, uh, Italy, that, that area, northern Italy, and he would be a little darker-skinned, uh, darker hair, a little darker eyes. He doesn't burn easily, but he, he tans fairly easily. But he still could burn, but not as easily as, as the first gentleman. There we go. And then this gentleman is more from southern, way southern Europe, Spain, maybe Israel, maybe Palestine, uh, India, Iran. He never, almost never burns. He tans, but he doesn't burn. Uh, and his tanning takes a while. His risk of skin cancer is low, but not zero. And here's somebody next who's African-American heritage. She has a very low risk, but not zero again. Uh, she would never burn, almost always tan a bit, but her skin would get a little darker in the summer, kind of a little lighter in the winter. Uh, good protection, but doesn't mean she doesn't wear, need, need to wear sunblock. She does. She just need, doesn't know it. That's the problem. Times of the day are important for UVB. Uh, sunny versus cloudy for UVB. Obviously, sunny days are... Are, are worse for UVB, but equal for UVA. Uh, geographic location, more sun in Miami, more sun in the central parts of uh, the country where we, it's pretty hot, and more UVB rays, UVA is equal. Altitude, you're a little closer. Denver is worse than the flats. And reflection, so if you're a skier, you're working around pools, you're getting reflected constantly, and you're getting kind of a double whammy uh, of, of sun damage. Uh, ozone layer, it's not a big deal anymore. 30 years ago when we were using hairsprays with uh, some fluorocarbons, we had problems. There was a big hole in the ozone layer. And I believe in southern Chile or Ecuador, they had an increased risk of skin cancer at that time. But I think it's been uh, filled in somehow because we don't use those things anymore. What are the effects of the sun? Well, you can get sunburn. You get tanning. You get aging, you get allergies, you get diseases, and you get cancer. That's kind of the sequence that I talk about. Allergies and diseases, people are sun allergic, they're taking blood pressure medicine, they tend to burn it a little easier, that's sort of an allergy. Uh, certain diseases like lupus uh, are made worse with sun exposure, and then skin cancer is the ultimate result. So you start out in sun damaged skin, let me look here for you, this is a little easier. You start out with sunburn, you get roughness, you get pigmentation, the brown liver spots people talk about. You get fine wrinkling, you get deeper wrinkling, you get precancers, and then you get skin cancer. You could be anywhere in this 
uh, game here, but most people, by the time you've reached kind of the middle part, you're going to start getting a lot of these. So you don't want to go there. You want to kind of stay away from that edge because it's once you go to that, it's like a precipitous decline, and we don't want that. If we can avoid it, of course, it's hard to always avoid. What does sun-damaged or photo-aged skin look like? Well, it's wrinkled, it's sagging, it's tough and leathery, it's got red, yellow, gray, or brown blotches, it's got these liver spots, which are not liver spots, they're actually brown spots from the sun. The body's trying to protect itself, so it lays down some pigment. It can't do an even layer, but it lays down these brown spots. And almost everybody has a few of these. You get more on the outer arms, and exposed areas and if you turn your arm around you'll never see them in here because unless we're monkeys we walk like this we don't walk like this and so uh, and you'll see it on the V of the neck uh, you'll never see it in the abdomen because people keep those areas protected upper back shoulders and I can kind of tell when people have burned or have had too much sun because their brown spots light up like a Christmas tree uh, and so they can't lie to me when they say they haven't been doing it. <laughs> I can tell. Yeah. Uh, actinic keratoses are precancers. Common, they're kind of the next step. They're over, well, that slide's gone, but they're over next. Um, this is uh, an interesting slide because these two people are related. So the one on the left is somebody who hasn't had much sun exposure, uh, not much sunlight, uh, and this, the one on the right is I believe her, her mom or grandma, it's been so long now. She's, most of the changes you see on the woman on the right uh, are sun damage related. So a lot of the creases, the wrinkling, the brown spots, just that lack of reflection of the skin is because of something called solar elastosis or sun damage. And so she's at higher risk for skin cancer. And, and you know, if she, I, think, I, believe she, I believe she was a farmer, so she never, of course, wore a lot of block and uh, that's, that was the problem. Question always comes up in the United States is, how come you didn't hear about skin cancer so much 100 years ago? Uh, well, because the people who were farmers, and most of us were more in agriculture 100 years ago, because the majority of the US was not in manufacturing or high tech, didn't exist then. We were dead by the time we were 40 or 50. We had died of diseases like TB or infectious diseases or injuries, and now we live 70, 80, 90, 100 out of a couple 105 year olds running around. Um, and so we get more of those cumulative changes. So if these people had lived longer 100 years ago, you would have only seen all this. Because a lot of patients say, well, my parents didn't have them. I said, when did your parents pass away? Oh, they passed when they were 50, 55. I said, well, because they didn't live long enough. But they would have gotten it anyway. So that's part of it. Um, this is a woman who was a lifeguard for 50 years. And most of the damage that you see on her face, the limb wrinkling, the kind of the, you see the reflection from the flash, but a lot of this is just a lot of damage and lack of protection. Um, and so it's, it's we, we, you know, we don't want to see this kind of tanned look on somebody because it, it's a bad sign for us. So those of you who remember little ozone, little orphan Annie, there's little ozone Annie. Um, and she's saying the sun will come out tomorrow and then she's kind of burned here. So yeah. we, don't, we don't want that. This is not what we... <laughs> would like to see, but this is a good good newspaper thing. Those of you who are under 40 probably never heard of Little Orphan Annie. I am, I am over 40, so I've heard of her and I've seen the play. It's a wonderful play if you ever see it. Um, let's talk about some benign skin, skin growths from the sun. Um, these are quite common and we'll, uh, we'll, you can sometimes find them on yourself. These are called actinic keratoses. They're benign but pre-malignant. Uh, little flaky kind of spots here that kind of you can rub them off and then they just sort of come off but they come back persistently and, and they just are a reflection of damage and one step before uh, a type of a skin cancer called a squamous cell but not a good percentage do develop into squamous cells it's not huge but it's so random you don't know which one's going to do it so you just kind of hit everything and try to kill it off because you don't want to be cutting these guys out you want to be getting rid of them and creams will work and other treatments that we use as well. And there's another gentleman with a, uh, let's see, a, a, a precancer on the cheek here. Keeps shaving over it and keeps uh, scabbing because it's not healing. Uh, it could be a skin cancer when it doesn't heal like that, but it's um, not, uh, uh, most likely isn't, but it could be if it doesn't heal with freezing. So. 
these are the brown liver spots that people ask about. They say, well, you know, we have these brown spots. They're from my liver. I go, no, they're from too much sun. You always get more on the left hand and you always get more on the hand itself, but the left is worse than the right usually because there's more exposure here, but uh, you can get them on both sides. And driving. Uh, driving, yes. Yeah. So if you, like yes, day before yesterday, I saw a patient and I could just, I said, look at your right side and your left side of your face. And he had more fine lines and wrinkles on the left than on the right. And so the guess is, um, here's a trick question, or not a trick question. Where do captains get more sun damage of, air, of airline? Because they're high, 30,000 feet high. What side, they, what, what side do we cut out skin cancers on captains of like A380s or 747s or big jets? I would think the left side. Yes. <laughs> and where do co-pilots get it? The right side. Right. And that's exactly been correlated. It's been shown very consistent. And they get it on the neck a lot. So they, you'll see it on their neck, on the right side, right face. And men like me who are follicularly challenged, we usually get it on our, a lot of it on the scalp. So that's a bad area because that's getting constant exposure and constant hits. And men forget to sunscreen this place. Men don't sunscreen anything, but whatever they, whenever <laughs> they do do it, they forget to do this spot. And, you know, it's just normal. But that's a bad area, and that's a hard area to treat because it's got so much damage, and it's consistent and constant. These are called seborrheic keratosis. Everyone has one. I think I have a little one on my hand. I've got to get it burned off someday. But um, very common, not malignant, not dangerous. We can leave them. This is probably the number one question that I get asked is, what is this spot? And these are very common. If you go to our website, centerforderm.com, there's a seborrheic keratosis link that talks just about these bumps. They're so commonly asked. And I say, just go to the link, look at all the photos, and you'll know what these are. And they're, partly they evolve from those liver spots that people call, and partly they're just sometimes occur spontaneously. They're not warts, they're not infections. So they're normal aging bumps, more common in sun-exposed areas, but can occur in non-sun-exposed areas too. So I tell people don't worry about them, but they inevitably worry a lot. So I tell them to reassure them. That's why we have websites now, so. <laughs> Every single spot here, every single one, though it looks all different, they're all separate keratosis. So that's what confuses people because there's not one consistent way that they look. So they can be black, they can be tan brown, they can be brown and black. The way to tell is you can almost look like you can flick them off with your finger. And if you just touch them, they'll just flick off. They also are kind of this roughened feeling. They're all similar in their behavior. They appeared around the same time. They don't change very rapidly. Sometimes if they itch, we freeze them, but I try to leave them alone if they don't bother people. If they bug people, we freeze them or cauterize them. But otherwise, I leave them alone. I tell people don't do anything with them because they're benign. Mostly they're cosmetic. They bother them. You know, we just, we'll do it if they don't want, but I usually try to avoid them. Um, but yeah, they look, this, look different, but that's what, you know, they've currently got a AI program that is looking at being able to diagnose this kind of stuff. Uh, using you know a, cam a digital camera, and I think it's being developed at either NYU or Stanford or a com combination, and that would be very useful. We're trying to add this AI functionality into our electronic systems that we have at work. We're going to see if that we can correlate. It'd be great. I'd love to be able to get a statistic and say this is the statistical chance of this being something or not, and the cameras are pretty good at detecting it. But they are not foolproof as I as we are not foolproof. So, uh, but they're getting there. So. Uh, malignant skin tumors. So anybody who's asleep should wake up at this point. This is the part that you should be listening to. Um, the incidence of skin cancer and melanoma is increasing very rapidly. 15 times more common now than in the 1930s. The reason for that is we go to Hawaii, we go to places that are sunny, and we got burned. It was very common to hear the statement, you know, I put baby oil on and lubed myself up and was in the sun for an hour or two or three when I was 15 or 20 years old. Yeah. That's the reason. And, and that occurred in the 60s and 70s and 80s. And by early 90s, we were pretty much telling people not to do that. Most people don't listen, and they still do it. I have many patients who still tan, uh, despite me telling them and warning them. But, you know, you can take a horse to water, but you can't make them drink it. So we got to be careful. Hawaii is the culprit here, we think. And time, people have the time on vacations. And the fact that the jets got you from Hawaii, from anywhere in the U.S. to Hawaii or Mexico or sunny places within three to five or seven hours. So that convenience of the 707 and other jets created, I think, a lot of these problems and people burned. Fair-skinned, blue-eyed, or blonde, or red-haired people have a very high risk of developing skin cancer. So once you are, have that pheno, what's called phenotype, 
watch out. You better protect yourself. A lot of these things are cancers. They're uncontrolled growths. They're not all serious, but they can be a headache to deal with. They can recur. They're a hassle. We don't want to deal with them, so we like to prevent them if we can, but when they happen, we deal with it. The three types of skin cancer are basal cell, squamous cells, and melanoma. The last one's the most important and the one that really is very relevant. Basal cell. What does a basal cell look like? Well, it's kind of this pearly growth that ulcerates, doesn't heal, you kind of pick at it, it it's a sore, doesn't want to go away, it kind of appears and then kind of just goes up like this and then stabilizes. It's on the nose, the scalp, the back, the chest, the shoulders, and it just doesn't want to go away. It just sort of stays there. So in my practice, anyone who's had one basal cell, I warn them, I say, look, if something doesn't heal in a month and you've tried it, making it heal with a little ointment and a Band-Aid, and you thought it was an injury, well, just let us know. And you know, leave a message for me and say, hey, this ain't healing. Can you get me in and just take care of it? And that's what we'll do. Many times it isn't anything, but sometimes it is. So if you look on this woman right here, it's like almost like a pearl that was just thrown on her face with this little blood vessel. And that's a classic description. It's got a little scab in the center. It doesn't want to heal. Keeps recurring and you know, going, um, uh, just doesn't want to go away. So this is called the good version of it. There's still a basal cell, but we call it the good, okay? This is the bad. This is kind of a bigger one that's been ignored. And again, somebody with a little more sun damage probably has another skin cancer right there. We're not talking about that one. That's a basal cell. This person's got, I probably had a few skin cancers. And this is the ugly one. This is the big oh. one. So this is the one you don't want to be looking at when you're eating dinner or lunch uh, or breakfast. So this is a woman who had a small basal cell, probably this size or this size originally. And this was 25 years before this photo was taken, okay? So that photo was taken 1989 or 1990 when I finished training, okay? So she left that little guy alone for 20, 30 years. She didn't do anything. So basal cells never kill anybody. I, it's one in 20,000 maybe do it, it's so rare. Never, I've only seen two cases. One was when I was in training and one was in practice. This woman just said, you know, I don't want anything to do, I don't want to do anything. So she ignored it. But well, what it did was it went from here into her spinal cord and then went to her brain and killed her. So she could have lived, she was I think only 75 or 70. Very young, you know, relatively young. Now I'm 59, everyone 70 looks young to me and I want to <laughs> you know, make it younger. But this is somebody who could have been prevented. I had a lady who had one on her eyebrow. It also moved into her brain after eight, nine years. It just got bigger and she ignored it. She just didn't want to do anything. So fear is a big thing for people, but I'm much more scared of this then it would be of a little guy. So it's, it's hard, I know, but I've got to kind of convince people that, you know, let's get this over with. Let's get it taken care of if we can. Obviously, they have the right to say no, but then this develops, and then I have to deal with this, which is not something pleasant for anybody, especially the patient, of course. And Medicare pays for the... Oh, yeah, Medicare. I mean, most insurers pay for it. If you have a deductible, that comes in, obviously. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, no, this is very... There's 6 million of basal cells, 5 to 6 million a year. So it's very common. And I have people with several of them. And so we see it all the time. So yes, absolutely take care of it if you can. Squamous cells, these are common. These are a little bit more kind of uh, aggressive, can be. And they kind of look like basal cells a little bit. No, not quite, but they kind of look. Again, 14% of all skin cancers can spread. I've seen one or two that have spread. Again, they were deep and thick and ignored. I got bigger squamous cell. I call this the inability to hide with makeup sign, meaning this thing finally got difficult to hide with makeup and that's why the patient came in. So we had to kind of take care of it, but we got rid of it. But it's getting large here. You know, it's, it's festering and not healing and difficult to take care of. So melanoma. Again, those of you who are asleep can wake up now. So hopefully you're not asleep. Well, this is pretty obvious. It's 1% of all skin cancers, less common than basal cells and squamous cells, but far more malignant. A shaded brown or black area that produces pigment will spread, not can, will spread to other parts of the body if you leave it alone. Best treated when diagnosed early. So you can see this is very abnormal looking. And this patient probably has 20 other, 30 other moles kind of thing that look no fairly normal. This is definitely out of step. And it's newer. So it's a new spot, changing, growing. And it fits what I call the A, B, C, D, E kind of, um, or ABCDS, I'm sorry, sorry, system. And A means asymmetric. You draw a line 
one side doesn't look like the other at all. These are not identical twins. B is border irregularity, okay? C is color variation, black, brown, whatever, clear here. D is diameter, okay? It's, got a, it's bigger than the head of a pencil eraser. So if that's six millimeters, so generally they're bigger than six millimeters. And um, S is symptoms. Often there's itching, burning, bleeding, some symptom with it, but sometimes not. Uh, a, B, C, D. There you go. This is asymmetric, irregular border, color variation, and diameter. Six millimeters or higher, which is the size of a pencil eraser head there. Okay. Here's another melanoma on the face. Not, com not common, but does occur. This is not a good sign, and this is definitely a bad sign. Because when it gets bumpy like this, the, the mortality with melanomas is correlated with the depth. This is at least three, four, five millimeters, it's, that's, that's not a good sign, okay? That's, that's a bad sign. So we don't want to see that. We have seen it, uh, but we don't want to see it. Uh, we found melanomas on the bottom of the feet. I had a gentleman who I was working with, and, uh, you know, we suggested that we get a full body exam, and, you know, one thing came up, and he couldn't come or something, and then he came, and he said, you know, I have this spot right below my underwear line, and it was a melanoma. It was thin, but we, we caught it. I found one on the buttocks recently. So we look at it. We try to look at everything, especially people who have a head of history melanoma. We try to look. I don't want to always find things, but uh, it does occur in the private areas, but most commonly on the you know, arms and back, but it can occur anywhere. Melanoma will be fatal if not detected early enough. I shouldn't say. Uh, I used to put can in that slide. That's one of my changes that I made. It's now will, so uh, we have to be careful here. Um, so you think that you have a hard job? <laughs> so these are people who have this is a real job. These are women, and women, no matter what men think, have much more sensitive olfactory or, or sense of smell. And this is, I believe, I forget which antiperspirant company this is, but they are testing antiperspirants, and they, you know, have to see how they work. And uh, you better get paid really well to do this job. I don't, yeah. I don't think I'd ever want to do it. But it is a real job. Prevention and treatment, very important. Um, skin cancer should be treated by a, der uh, a dermatologist or other MD who is trained to do it. So many doctors do do this. We're kind of the de facto people, uh, but if you have a good primary or a good surgeon or somebody that manages you, we, we don't have a problem. Somebody needs to manage you. And it's got to be done on a fairly consistent basis. Uh, and, and if you've had skin cancer, the way we like to do it is see you fairly frequently because in the first five years, if you have one basal cell, the risk of a second one is 50%. If you have two basal cells, the risk of a third one is 100%. So we like to just try to find them early and be done with them. Um, we'll do other things as prevention, but we, we try to hit them early. So uh, some of the methods of treatment, you can freeze them, which nobody hardly does anymore. You can scrape and burn them out, and that's called electrodesiccation and curatage, which we do for people much very old who don't want anything much done but want to take care of it. We do surgery, which is generally the best way. Now, there are a few creams out there. There's a genital wart cream that works decently. Uh, there are some other creams and light treatments that are where people are working on, not officially approved yet. So whenever I, we do use it, I say, hey, this is not officially approved. I've seen some success. Let's try it. If it doesn't work, let's do something else. So as, people, as long as people, as people are adventurous and wanting to, to you know, try stuff and realizing that basal cells don't spread, so we can, we've got some time. We can buy time. If you take a basal cell off it and a bit of it remains, it takes a year for it to get a year or two to get back to what its original size was. So we've got time, but we don't want to wait 20 years or 10 years or anything like that. Some prevention techniques, very important. We don't want to be cutting or freezing if we can do this. Avoid sun during peak hours, okay? Before 10 a.m. or after 3. Uh, use sunscreen SPF greater than 30, and I'll go over that. Wear loose clothing that covers exposed parts and wear a hat. Avoid tanning, sunburns, or using tanning booths. This is a picture from Miami on my last few days. So obviously you can look at this woman's chest. She's burned. He's burning himself, and you know he'll have fun when he has to have things cut or burned out. But it doesn't mean you can't enjoy the sun. You just have to be protective and try to stay off the beach a lot. Is the woman in yellow back there doing a pretty good job? She's doing an excellent, excellent job. Thank you for, I, you know, I've had this picture for almost 30 years, and I've not commented on that woman. This woman is great. She's protected. Uh -huh. She's covered, you know, a little sunscreen here and there. She's enjoying. This woman's, all the yellow people are good. Yellow and wearing hats. Uh, the ladies are smarter than the men. I don't see the, oh, they're, they're, they're all ladies. Uh, baseball hat. Baseball hat. There. That's great, yeah. <laughs> He's doing good, yeah. 
Don't do that. This is actually not a real burn. This is a makeup, a makeup for an ad, I think, from Johnson & Johnson. Ugh. Sunscreens. Very important. Photo protection. A prized sunscreen or a sunblock. You can see this woman's wearing a hat. Sunglasses. Protected. Sunscreen. Wear protective clothing. And read a good book. We like good books. Can you tell us about something about sunglasses? Yeah, they're good for protecting the eyes from cataracts and may have some protective basis for melanoma, which does occur in the eye. It's rare. I've only had one or two patients with it, but it's, it can. It, I think it's more for cataract protection uh, and uh, probably reducing the fine lines and wrinkles around the eyes would be good to, to do that because that's partly sun damage related and expression related to muscle relief. So sun protection factor is the burn time without sunscreen, say it's 10 minutes and the burn time with sunscreen is 150 minutes. So that would be 15 divided, 150 divided by 10, which is it's on SPF factor of 15. Those of you who are mathematically inclined will know that we recommend 30 to 50 sunblocks. Anything above a 50, the incremental difference between 50 and 100 is maybe only 1% more protection. So it doesn't make a big difference. So some people come into my office and say, oh, you know, I have 150 or 3,000 SPF. Well, it doesn't make much of a difference. You're just paying extra for stuff you don't need. So I, I just tell people 30 to 50. 15 used to be the standard in the 90s. Now, since the 2000, 2005, I think, we're recommending 30s or greater. And uh, we have that on the website as well. You can read about how to use it. Um, you want to be like this guy. He's a headhunter from New Guinea. He's pretty <laughs> well protected. I hope he doesn't cut anybody's head off anymore. But he's, you can see he's got good protection almost everywhere. He's got a beard, a hat. He's very well protected. Be like this person, greased up, but that's a little too greasy. I think nobody wants that. That's a big problem with sunblocks. So this slide's in here illustrating why people don't use sunblocks. The majority of sunblocks are very greasy. So they may be excellent in what they provide, but they are too greasy, so you've got to find something you like. And I, I'll talk to people, and I'll, they'll say, oh, I've got 20 sunblocks. Do you use any of them? No. Why? Because they're greasy. And men are notoriously hate using sunblocks. So... SPF 30 or greater, this is titanium or zinc. This is a good brand. Actually, this is the one I wear, but you can pick anything you want. I'll give you Neutrogena is good. There's some that are makeup induced. You can wear those. There's a ton of them. And if, again, if you go to the website, there's a list of them, like 30 of them or 20 of them. As a woman, do you put the sunblock on first and mm -hmm. then your makeup, your cover? Yes. So it's always moisturizer, sunblock, and makeup. And many sunblocks are moisturizing, but not too yeah. thick. The lip is important. This says SPF 15. Older slide, now they're up to 30 to 50, and many brands make it. Uh, sunscreen recommendations. Again, very important. Any brand with titanium dioxide and zinc oxide and or, but usually better with both, with SPF greater than 30, up to 50, UVB and UVA protection blockers that you will use regularly is okay. The key is that you will use regularly. Again, that you will use regularly. <laughs> Other ingredients like avobenzone, all these big chemical names, are good, but we're trying to get away from them because they may have some, some rare incidence of hormone blockage and other things. Nobody's quite sure. And, when, and the internet is full of conspiracy theories about these sunscreens. I try to get away from that, and I just tell people use titanium and zinc. And the micronized version's better. Now, there are things on the internet talking about how that could be a problem. You know what? I, I tell people, let's be logical here. This is better to use something than to use nothing. I can find on the internet where it says that the sun revolves around the earth, but I usually don't believe it. So we've got to use logic here. Um, these are good, but can be more irritating. So I try to stay away from them, but I can't avoid them sometimes. Most are good. Look for ones that are lighter. If you, and if you have oily skin or moisturizing, if you have drier skin. So that's a logical thing. You want to try to do less products if you can, but pick anything you like with those things. Price does not correlate with effectiveness. Many of my patients come in and say, you know, I bought this. $70 sunscreen, I said, you spent way too much. And then they look at me with red faces and then they listen to me and they buy what's on the list or whatever they want, but it's in there. Sprays are not as good as lotions or creams. Apply 15 minutes before going out and reply every, reapply every two to three hours, otherwise the sunscreen's gone. So the best example I can give people is people say, you know, I'm busy. And then I look at them and I said, you think I'm not busy? Have you seen how many people are waiting to see me today? So I see them. And I say, look, when I leave the office, I put it on. So when I'm leaving the studio today, I got it in my car, I'm going to reapply it. Because I'm darker skinned than most of my patients, or a lot of my patients, but I will reapply it because I, I don't want to be freezing anything on me or having somebody cut on me if I can avoid it. 
Uh, water resistant only lasts for 80 minutes in, in the water and must be reapplied. So that's another thing. The only time I ever got burned in my life was when I was in Hawaii about 15 years ago. And my, me and my son got a little bit of a burn because we didn't reapply the sunblock. We didn't follow this rule. We forgot. Now, I read that in Hawaii they're talking about banning yes. sunblock. Yes. Because of the killing fish or something. Well, there are now. So titanium and zinc probably are the better sunblocks because they're inert. Um, yeah, I, I got it, and I've, I I don't know how to get around that. In in Mexico, uh, in certain areas like in Cancun, they don't allow you to go in the water with chemically based sunblocks, and for good reason. I think they they do have some problems with the fish and stuff. So yes, I agree. The environment is very important, uh, but I think titanium and zinc are relatively inert, so I think they're better. But I can't. I'm not an expert on that. Um, always apply after you med any medications, such as those for acne or if you have rashes. Put makeup over the sunblock. So it's always medication, sunblock, makeup. Okay, that's kind of the rule. Now there are makeups, which I showed you, which are like powders that you can just apply. And many men like powders. The, I have many <laughs> male patients who will take it out and say, look, I'm using this. And I go, great, do it. I'd rather have you do something. And they said, my wife gave it to me, because, or my you know, partner gave it to me, and he's using it, I'm using it. Great, go for it. Um, some makeup has sunscreen. Look for those with greater than 30. Many of them are just over 25, so that's good. Uh, 15 I would probably not use. This is a big, big thing that people tell me. You know, I got a 15 sunblock, and I got a 15 makeup, so obviously I got 30. I go, no. Two layers of 15 does not equal 30. The protection is that of the highest SPF. So if you have a 25 and a 15, it's only 25, not 40. I hope that makes sense. Recommendations. This is not a complete list, but these are the ones I like and use. Elta, Solbar, Neutrogena, and Aveeno. By the way, Neutrogena and Aveeno are the same product. They're made by the same company. They're just mm -hmm. branded differently. So whatever you can, if you look at the ingredients, they're almost virtually the same. And I, I used to have a list of which ones were the same, but uh, you know, the names were the same, but the names were different, but the products were exactly the same. So look to see which one's on sale. Yeah. yeah. But these, you find the least greasy one. That's the key. The brands marketed and ones with titanium or zinc. The brands marketed under the name of a store are cheaper, but tend to be oilier. So just remember that. So if you have dry skin, it doesn't matter. And not as pleasant to use. So again, this factor of unpleasantness of use is a big problem for people. So I tend to push that a lot. I go, find the one you like and use it. Because of this, they may not be used as regularly as they should. But if you like it, be my guest. I don't have a problem with it. Vitamin D, not a big problem. Many people are vitamin D deficient because we, we're indoors most of the time. We're not outdoors enough um, or enough at the right time. So I tell everyone takes a supplement. And by the way, low vitamin D is correlated with cardiac disease and breast cancer. So I tell everybody, hey, just get it checked. It's like a routine check. I have low vitamin D. I'm taking vitamin D. My wife is too. Most of the uproar has been created by the tanning industry to scare people. So there's one guy on the web and represented by the tanning industry, of which there are many tanning booths around here, and he says, oh, vitamin D is an epidemic. It is because people aren't, are not outdoors at all. They're sitting on their computers doing the internet stuff. So that's, that's the key. So you've got, you're going to need a supplement or, or natural foods that contain vitamin D, green leafy vegetables, etc. Do a monthly skin self-examination called an early warning system. Do this if you are at high risk group. It's not necessarily if you've got skin like mine or darker, but if you're fair skinned, you should probably do it. And uh, this brochure that I'm going to show you is actually going to be on our website soon, but it's at the American Academy of Dermatology website, aad.org, which is also linked through our website. So we have a lot of links that you can hit. Um, and this is good for people who've had melanoma or skin cancer. Get themselves or a partner or a spouse, somebody needs to look at them, especially their back, the butt, places that they don't look at, you know, and it's a good brochure. Look for growths or moles that are changing in size, color, or shape. Things that are out of step. I use the, core, I use the um, analogy, in Africa, if you see a sea of zebras, you know, a bunch of zebras on the Serengeti Plain, and you have one horse, which is the abnormal guy or gal? It's the horse. So if you've got tons of brown guys on your back and you have one new black spot that you never saw before, that's the guy or gal you've got to worry about. It's called the sea of zebras analogy, and, and, or the group of zebras, or group of horses. So if you see a zebra in the center of all the horses on the plain in Colorado, that's the, that's the unusual, and that's what you've got to watch out for. And it's something that wasn't there before. Most melanomas, which is the ones you've got to worry about, develop in new, as new lesions, rarely in an existing mole. 
though it does happen, I just had a patient with that. But 90% of the melanomas that I've seen are newer spots, something that was not there a year or five years ago, okay? Growths that are moles that you're itching, bleeding, hurting, or won't heal. It's obvious if it's not, if there's something going on here, you, that's what you gotta take care of. Follow the ABCDS system. Asymmetry, border irregularity, color, diameter, symptoms. Again, all this thing, asymmetry, irregular border, non-uniform color, diameter growth, symptoms. Again, if it's smaller than the head of a pencil eraser, probably not a problem, though I've found melanomas who are smaller, not common. Please avoid this. Avoid excessive tanning, sun exposure, and number of sunburns. It's directly related to your risk of skin cancer or melanoma. So people say, well, I'm an active person. I have many 60, 70, 80 year olds who are out all the time. Do it after 10, three or before 10. You're retired for God's sake. You can do whatever you want. So I said, make the schedule that way. Don't go out in the middle of the day. Let every other fool do it. You need to protect yourself. So that's what I tell people. And the, the middle of the day is a bad time, but other times it's fine. Get a yearly complete skin examination by your personal physician or dermatologist if you're at high risk. We had a basal cell, melanoma, squamous cell. We also find people don't have good follow-ups. Like they'll, they lived in Seattle, now they moved down here and it's been three years since they were seen and they had two melanomas. Bad news, don't do that. Put that as your part of your normal health thing. You know, you get your male examination, female examination, you get your cholesterol, just put that in there and have somebody look. If you're not comfortable who's looking, find somebody you're comfortable with, okay? Any suspicious growth should be brought to the attention of your personal physician or dermatologist ASAP. Uh, you know, sooner rather than later, I tell my patients, if you can't get in, leave a message for one of us. We'll call you and say, what do you got? What do you got? And now with the era of the internet, we tell people, email us the photos. If you see something, or you know, many times email is not as good because the photo quality is not the best, we just bring them in and we just find somebody that can see them and get, take care of them. Some good resources. We have a website that has a skin cancer link and other links. AAD.org is actually quite good. That's our national organization. Um, there's a couple of skin cancer links that are on this and this has good photographs and, and things. Uh, and soon we're going to be adding uh, a functionality where you can actually, oh, it's actually on there already. It's a mole mapping functionality where you can actually take photos and store it on this, this free site and kind of look at your moles. And I, uh, there's a newer one coming up that you can actually superimpose what you had before the current photograph and can kind of track it. Um, I don't know how sophisticated it's, it is yet, but I think it's we're working on it. Mm, that's interesting. Yeah, I yeah, know. along with AI. I think AI is really the future for us and be able to like photograph or at least, uh, I take a lot of pictures and I, you know, because of my dig digitization of our medical records, I can kind of go back and forth and look. And we've been able to diagnose things because sometimes well, what we think is nothing, take a picture, we'll look at it three months later, say, oh, this has changed. Haven't found too much that's been abnormal, but it's always reassuring that way. Photos are wonderful. So this is a guy who's out in the middle of nowhere with a dead animal, and he's not asking for water. He's just asking for a lot of sunscreen, so that's kind of the dermatologist's best friend. So I'd like to thank you for inviting me, and hopefully this has been a useful and informative talk, and happy to answer any questions that people have. Oh, thank you. Uh, do you uh, want to give any contact information, or is there contact on the website? Uh, it's it's on the website www.centerforderm.com, uh, and all the you know there's phone numbers, an 800 number, people can contact us or questions, and our email address is contact us at centerforderm.com, uh, and we're happy to you know answer uh, non-patient related, specific related questions. Uh, if, uh, if, because of privacy regulations, we can give you general answers, but not very specific ones. And, and uh, uh, but we can, you know, give you resources or recommend somebody in your area if you need to see somebody, because we know most of the people that are good.